Well, friends, uh, today we are going to discuss the nature of society. Actually, before we take up concrete social issues like family, economic institutions, religious institutions, it was necessary for us to talk about what is society, what is the relationship between individual and society, what is the subject matter of sociology, who are founding fathers of sociology, what are groups, and this we have done. We will spend some more time on understanding the relationship between individual and society. And after that, we will come to a specific institutions or more concrete issues facing society. You have seen uh, the definition of group. If I write the main characteristics of groups, then groups are collections of individuals, this is one aspect that a number of individuals are present. Aggregates, they are aggregates. In groups are aggregates of individuals. And if you uh, remember the uh, concept of degree of uh, group formation, then any aggregate of individuals, including mob, crowds, passers-by, can be seen to be forming a group. But that is first degree of group. Sociologists are not so much concerned with first degree of group. We seldom have to deal with first degree group. We are more interested in higher order groups and it is these higher order groups which affect our thinking, our uh, feelings, our behavior, our belief systems, values and norms. So the other properties of groups which will make them sort of perfect group, fourth degree group, some kind of perfect group. What do we need to add to aggregates? is interaction, that the members of a group interact among themselves. Second thing we have to add is a unity, a sense of belongingness to group, unity. You identify with the groups. So you identify with the groups you are part of in Indian society, in world society. And all the groups have some internal organization or structure, organization or structure. Aggregates which meet all these requirements that the members of the groups interact they have a sense of unity. Accordingly, you have the concept of in-groups, out-groups, and then there is some minimal degree of organization. That groups are organized, means uh, there are certain rules of the game according to which behavior of members in the group is regulated. It's not random or chaotic the behavior has to be organized. It must be in accordance with certain rules of behavior. When you have the organization also, then you have fourth degree of group. So Gisbert says that in, in the first degree of group, you can include crowds, mobs. And in the fourth degree group, you can include community. like village community, like caste, which are independent, in a way independent of uh, individuals thinking, feeling, acting. 
we are born in a community even when you withdraw from the community or you migrate from one community to another the community survives you may uh, you may be born in kanpur get early education in kanpur go for higher education to mumbai then go to bangalore for job all this does not affect the community of kanpur community of kanpur is independent of individuals thinking feeling acting and in that sense it is a fourth degree fourth degree group in that connection i also made a difference between values and norms values are the standards of behavior values are the matters of right and wrong good and bad beautiful and ugly so aesthetics they are standards of behavior and norms are the guidance norms guide or regulate human behavior in pursuance of the values of society another thing i mentioned uh, i am saying uh, sort of recapitulating it so that there is more clarity on these issues that human behavior is learned human behavior is not instinctive it's not biologically determined at the as the behavior of plants and animals is human behavior is completely not learned some sociologists even go to the extent of saying that you can't even give a single instance of human behavior behind which you can say that there are only biological factors and uh, there is no role of socialization norms culture that the behavior is completely biological or instinctive in case of human beings there is no instinctive behavior even when humans make their houses then unlike uh, birds or animals there is variety and the variety proves whenever there is variety in human behavior it proves that human behavior is more of a learned behavior and it's not instinctive there is no biogrammar or biological reasons behind human behavior look and uh, while talking about norms i also made a distinction between various types of norms folk ways mores uh taboos i think for greater clarity if i say that there is a continuum from folk ways to taboos uh that all kinds of laws of human behavior can be put on a continuum from folk ways folk ways then more and then taboos and this is in accordance with adherence to or emotions attached laws laws of human behavior and uh, i said that there is a factual order in society and there is a normative order just by knowing the factual order or by knowing the facts of society you cannot understand a society to understand a society is to understand both 
facts of society as well as the normative pattern normative order factual order as well as the normative order again for greater clarity we can divide all the norms into three into three major categories folk ways mores and taboos this is on the basis of adherence to or emotions attached to although most of the time our behavior is regulated by folk ways from that point of view from the point of view of uh, which things govern our behavior most of the time it is folk ways some sociologists say that folk ways constitute the alpha and omega of human behavior always wherever we are whether we are in a classroom or we are in a family or we are with a dean or we are listening to political leaders or we are participating in a religious ceremony in a temple our behavior is governed by folk ways we get addicted to folk ways we don't have to think every day whether we should follow certain uh, norm regarding hair style food uh, language communication uh, cleanliness or hygiene nutrition greetings etiquette uh, interaction with other people so uh, adherence to folk ways happens automatically because we are addicted we get addicted to folk ways we do not have to take such decisions every day food life style morning walk if there is a norm that people in some community in some neighborhood get up early at 4 o'clock and go for a morning walk they don't have to take decision every day whether they will go for morning walk or not this is just Uh, automatic people become addicted folk ways are the alpha and omega alpha and omega of human behavior all the time the biggest and the most important of the folk ways for us is perhaps the example of language whatever language lang uh, rules of grammar are we know that they are arbitrary there is no reason why uh, the rules of grammar should be the way they are and different languages have their own customs grammars of german language french language english language hindi language bengali even in indo aryan languages in european language in groups of languages grammars are different but grammars are folk ways the, uh, if there is a violation of uh, folk ways if there is a violation of rules of grammar nothing serious happens to society so society also does not bother about that mores are more important and taboos although the, uh, some people can say that the only difference between mores and taboos is that when they are stated positively they are called mores and when they are stated negatively they are called taboos but some people think that the very fact that there are not only prescriptions but also proscriptions you will not do this you will you must uh desist from doing something you must refrain from doing something you must not even think of something that shows that such norms are of greatest consequence to society that's why there is proscription if there is no norm regarding regulation of sexual behavior if there is nothing like incest if there are no norms mores and taboos regarding sex then organized social life would become impossible actually from sociological point of view the norms have been made not to satisfy your needs not to satisfy needs of individuals but to satisfy the needs of society norms exist for society and uh, it is from that perspective in sociology course we should see at everything
from the perspective of society. Maybe sometime violation of social norms uh, may uh, lead to promotion of interests of some individuals, but uh, the fact that they are called norms shows that somewhere deviation from the norms damages the interests or needs or laws of society. So, we are looking at norms from the point of view of needs of society. And since uh, emotions, since uh, uh, we are supposed to adhere most to these things, so there are also emotions attached to them. If you ever violate a folk ways, if we speak uh, incorrect English in classroom or maybe in some interview or while you are talking to your friends in the hostel, you speak in incorrect English or sometime while in India, uh, you should drive to your left, but you drive to the right. Hmm? Uh, there is no great consequence, there is no emotional shock. There is no emotional shock, although you are deviating from the norms of society. Suppose someday uh, from your family, suppose the norms of your community, your family are such that you should take only vegetarian food and the norms are very strong. So, you never take non-vegetarian food, you take only vegetarian food. Sometime in the company of your friends, you take one piece of chicken or one piece of mutton somewhere you have violated the norms of your community, your family, your community. But again, you have forget about it. You remain vegetarian and you can even tell yourself that I am a vegetarian person. It just happened once in my life that in the company of my friends, I took a piece of mutton. But that does not show that I have inclination for non-vegetarian food. I am a vegetarian person. Because your, uh, if a vegetarian person takes a piece of meat, a piece of mutton or even beef uh, or pork or some day, some ham uh, with bread you take ham, you are not supposed to take, but you take ham, theek hai, you may forget about it. But when you violate the taboos ever, <coughs> things which are proscribed, you should not indulge in them. But if you ever violate taboos, then there is a guilt that you carry in yourself throughout your life. There is a guilt at, because the emotions attached to taboos are large. So, you carry, suffer from guilt and you suffer from guilt throughout your life. Some people after violating taboos uh, may suffer from guilt so intensely that uh, they may become a psychiatric case and they go to a psychiatrist and in sittings with psychiatrist, psychiatrist comes to know that you ever violated a taboo, hmm? you ever uh, behaved in a manner you should not have behaved. Then uh, if Friday and psychoanalysis is correct, then you recover. There is great emotion attached to taboos. Now, this also, uh, uh, this also shows that in something which I keep on saying that in sociology there is nothing absolutely correct or absolutely incorrect. It is not mathematics. There is no right or wrong answer. It all depends on the perspective and the concepts that we use are only to help us in analyzing, understanding, uh, interpreting social behavior and maybe making some degree of prediction, but there, are, there is more fuzziness in uh, study of society than in natural sciences. So, when I was giving, giving you the example of a vegetarian person sometime in the company of friends taking uh, a piece of mutton, is that a student violating folk ways or moose or taboos? So, I was telling you that it is a small thing, maybe once in life in the company of your friends, you smoke or you take ham or you take a piece of mutton. 
and you forget about it. You continue to think that you are non-smoker, teetotaler, and you are a vegetarian person, uh, and maybe vegetarian for a religious cause. But when I said that maybe you sometimes take beef also, if you are a devout Hindu and you are from outside Kerala, then uh, to take beef is to indulge in very serious sinful activity. You may take a piece of mutton in the company of your friends, but you will never think of taking a piece of beef in company of your friends. And if you ever take beef, then you suffer from a guilt lifelong. And maybe in your life, in leisure time or otherwise, uh, you read more of religious literature or you take interest in uh, religious spiritual discourses, then you are gone. You will always remember that I have violated a very important rule, a very important rule of conduct of Hindu life and that is that I should not have taken beef. If you have taken mutton, so again you see in vegetarian, non-vegetarian items also, there is a hierarchy. And uh, from that point of view, I can say that taking eggs or not taking, for vegetarian people, if they ever take eggs, it's a violation of a kind of folk ways. Or uh, if you come from a family in which even onion is not taken, at one time in several families, onions were not taken, garlic was not taken, anything grown inside the earth was not taken, potatoes also were not taken. If you take onion, you take potato, you can't escape potatoes if you are living in IIT Kanpur and eating in the mess. So there is no sin. You know, emotions attached to onions or emotions attached to garlic are not so significant, but emotions attached to taboos are so great that we should not even think of ever involving in taboos. You should not even think of saying that uh, uh, we, we can negotiate with China more rationally. After all, uh, the line of control is the result of policy pursued by the British government. There is nothing great about them. And then there are many areas which are under the possession of Indian government. But Indians or India has no benefit from possessing those areas. We are unnecessarily spending defense money on uh, keeping several areas of Arunachal Pradesh under our possession. Let us give them to China. If China wants, let China take over. If Pakistan wants, let the pa Kashmir go to Pakistan. Or uh, maybe if, uh, some people can even argue rational, on rational basis, mathematical, economic or other basis, that it will be better if certain part of Kashmir goes to Pakistan. But even the very thought of this kind uh, will create a shock and a guilt in my mind. What kind of Indian I am? As a patriotic Indian, I am responsible for uh, preserving every inch of my motherland. It, it will be a taboo to think like that. So, uh, it's a matter of degree. If you attach more importance to some norms, or if some norms are more important for the survival, maintenance, growth, adaptation, maturity, evolution of society, then they are towards to taboos. And if they are least important, they only make a, uh, an organized, predictable uh, life possible, they are folk ways when there are no emotions attached. Again, to give you an, an example of groups uh, from India, before coming to class, I was thinking that uh, what example I can give uh, in the class to explain what kind of groups we are part of. So let us take village India, more than 70 percent population of India still lives in villages and nearly 80 percent population lives in villages or village-like situations. In village, traditionally, 
the system is so village is a community you are part of a community village is a community almost all of us have come from village community if not in this generation then in the previous generation many of you uh, or most of you are born in cities only but if you ask your parents perhaps both your parents or at least one of them was born in the village village is a community village was not formed uh, village was not formed by your parents they were born in a village this is a community fourth degree of uh, social group interaction aggregate structure organization meaning identity unity uh, identity with the village can be so great that there are matches football matches between two villages and you must encourage motivate uh, team of your village it's like uh, in your iit system hall hall 2 uh, and hall 3 strong identity with hall 2 and hall 3 when our old students come back after 20 years 25 years some after 30 40 years with their they have grown old uh, they come with their spouses they are also old children grown up sons and daughters the first thing they would like to do is to go to hall because they were either in hall 2 or in hall 3 and their identity uh, with hall 2 or hall 3 remains so strong when they are working in new york uh, and when they meet other iitians from kanpur they will first ask whether you are in hall 2 or hall 3 so as as for iit kanpur students this uh, hall 2 hall 3 identity is very important for a common indian in village society was the village identity perhaps next to village was caste if a villager is asking you who are you perhaps or in most cases he is asking about your caste and you say i am singh the villager will not be happy because there are singhs of all types so he, he will ask further what kind of singh you are are you a rajput are you a kurmi are you a yadav are you a dalit what kind of singh you are there are all kinds of singh all kinds of loins <laughs> and uh, unless uh, our villager comes to know that you are loin of this type you are singh of this type he will not be satisfied so village com- village was a community and village community was further divided into you can call it a group also community is a group any ag- any aggregate of individuals is a group society is also a group world is also a group you can see world as a, as a group as a society uh, and uh, the only difference is that society is the largest distinguishable unit it is largest as compared to other groups you are part of iit group of males or females age group uh, caste uh, regional groups linguistic groups cultural groups religious groups up uh, all these groups are within within society society is the largest group so society is the largest distinguishable you can distinguish this group uh, from other group from other societies uh, certainly indians are not pakistanis and indians are not malayas indians are not germans so society is the largest distinguishable unit of interacting it must satisfy all the requirements of group formation of interacting individuals who share a pattern of social organization there is a pattern of social organization their behavior in indian society is not chaotic not random there is a pattern of social organization that regulates the interaction between them and this means that there are organizations and there are norms in society the largest group largest surviving group which can be distinguished from other groups in which you are member of various organizations and your interaction with others is governed by the norms of society so for example in a uh, group like village village is a community uh, in village there are sub groups 
for example the subgroups uh, in a in a village of india around independence uh, you could write groups like there are land owners there are other groups like tenants share croppers who work on others farm cultivate uh, owner cultivators you can distinguish land land owners from owner cultivators land owners means usually they possess land but they do not cultivate there are land owners there are owner cultivator there are tenants share croppers there are priests so a number of groups like priests carpenters blacksmiths each village has its own blacksmith potter there are potters there are barbers service cast barbers there are launderers there are menial workers or menial workers or there are sweepers okay so these are indian society is a large group within indian society there are so many groups and one of the group is village all indian so uh, in the beginning of last century 90% population lived in villages only 10% population lived in urban areas 90% population was in village so almost all indians nine indians out of 10 were member of some village and this village was further divided into a number of groups uh, you can call them land owners tenants priests carpenters blacksmith potters barbers launderers or washermen menial workers and sweepers in each village you find that all these groups are there now within each group again there are sub groups there may be uh, two or more houses of land owners family you may call it family one family two this is again a group family is also a group in family there is much more face to face interaction and uh, therefore family is a kind of primary group when we uh, when charles horton cooley made a difference between primary groups and secondary groups he said primary groups shape our life more they are small in size most of the interaction is face to face and uh, family is one such group family family one family two land owners similarly in the uh, group of tenants there may be 10 15 40 families priest several families f1 f2 f3 three families uh, in the category of priest like that in sweepers again there are families families also a group it's a primary group as compared to family this caste or sub caste is more second and as compared to uh, a caste village is more secondary as compared to village uh, the taluka or tehsil or district is more secondary as compared to that you, uh, your state is more secondary so primary and secondary group uh, then there is another village there also village if we call it village 1 and village 2 in village 2 also you have all these in village 2 also you have land owners family 1 2 3 
tenants, family one, two, three, priests, family one, two, three. Within family also you have identifiable social groups. You know, in family you have males and females. And this division into males and females is a very significant division for students of sociology. Because in all societies, including India, uh, rights and obligations are heavily dependent on the sex. What we are expected to do in society? What are our entitlements? What kind of person we will shape into when we grow up? Our, uh, what will be our interactions with other members of society? They are all heavily dependent on our sex or gender. That's why we talk of patriarchy, patriarchal society in which males or fathers are more powerful. Matriarchy in which mothers are more powerful. There have been a lot of research into this area that for thousands of years, uh, humans lived in matriarchal society in which mother was more powerful. But gradually, with industrialization, economic development, modernization, urbanization, and impact of world religions, all world religions are patriarchal. Islam is heavily patriarchal. Christianity is heavily patriarchal. Hinduism is heavily patriarchal. So when our tribals or our village people uh, accepted all these world religions or converted to other world religions, all religions are equal culprit. All religions have taken away, industrialization, modernization and religions have taken away power from females and given it to males. So this female-male distinction is also important. Within each family, you have female. Female 1, female 2, several females of different age groups. Age group is also a group. Males, male 1, male 2, male 3. These males are further divided according to age. All are not equally powerful. All males are not equally powerful. When we say that males are more powerful than females, it means uh, the oldest male, the oldest male uh, who is the owner of movable and immovable property, at least a symbolic head, that symbolic head is more powerful. Among females, uh, symbolic mother-in-law is more powerful. A daughter-in-law is not supposed to do anything uh, without taking permission from mother-in-law whom she will mix with, what activities schedule she will follow the whole day, when she should go for sleep, when she should wake up, what activities she is supposed to do after waking up, is completely structured by mother-in-law. So all, all, as a rule in patriarchal society, males are more powerful than females, but all males or all females are not equally powerful or equally powerless. Uh, Mother-in-law is more important. There have been uh, studies uh, among tribes uh, in Australia and several other areas. They have been documented and our introductory sociology books also talk about them. That there is a hierarchy of importance, power. In most Bread winning person, adult male, adult males who are responsible for bread are seen to be very important. So, uh, in times of crisis, so all societies also have to decide about what to do with powerless people. Children are powerless, old people are powerless, they are not even needed by society. Old people are not needed, children are needed, they are the future citizens, but old people are not needed. So society has to think about, there are extremes. Uh, in western society today, the richest persons are the old people, they are called senior citizens. And society is protecting all their health, food, financial, all kinds of interests. 
they are surviving on social security, pension, provident funds, mutual funds. In our country also all these things are becoming sources of dependence in old days. They are not working. But the society has to keep them alive. It's a wasteful expenditure from social point of view. From one perspective, society is spending unnecessarily. And now the conflict in Western society like Europe and uh, in America is so intense that people have actually started talking about these things. That as the process of aging is on, uh, as life expectancy has gone up, proportion of old people has also gone up. So proportion of people who are unproductive and they are just surviving. And the society has to pay for their food, medicine, housing, this and that, you know, is enormous. There are other cases, examples of tribals of Australia, like uh, where in times of crisis, old people were expected to commit suicide. When in times of crisis, uh, children were killed, particularly female, they practiced female infanticide. And in some extreme cases, there are records that in drought situation, they not only killed female babies, they also ate them. Extreme, society consists of extreme cases. Nothing, and I don't know what is right or wrong. As a student of sociology, we can only observe. We can say that societies are like that. Societies have values, norms, culture. In village too, again, you have all these things. So there is uh, a priest family priest and in priest there are F1, F2, F3 family. In our society because we practice village exogamy, we do not marry within the village. So some people of F1 are connected to F2 of village 2, likewise village 3 and so on. And this kind of relationship is called kinship, blood relations. Kinship. This is another group. Relationships are not confined to village and uh, caste and uh, family or household or males or females or age groups. There are relationships of various kinds. Now you have kinship. Similarly, uh, all these people, all these castes and sub-castes and communities are part of some state. There is a king. There may be a small kingdom. Uh, and they are all part of that small kingdom. So the whole society like this consists of a political unity also. Now you see, uh, on uh, these basis, and when say uh, Britishers come to India and develop their own administration, they develop some new economic activities, some new occupations mostly connected with administration and education. So accordingly, new types of groups are formed. Some are educated, some are uneducated, some are less educated, some are literate, some are illiterate. New groups are formed. Some become peons, some become clerks, some become uh, civil servants, ICS officers. So there is a hierarchy of bureaucrats. New groups are formed. And all these groups exist within society called India. All these groups. Uh, in a bigger group, that bigger group is the society of India. And there are interactions between these groups. We will talk about these interactions in the next class. There is cooperation, there is conflict, there are interests, there are emotions on the basis of which people conduct themselves. So this is what a complex configuration of groups and subgroups within a larger entity, uh, the biggest group society uh, exists. Now, some people today are talking of uh, world, global society, global village. Can we say that world is a society? World society, does it make sense to say that there is a world society? or a world society is emerging, or world society exists. If you uh, apply the criteria used for the definition of group, including society, uh, world may be seen as a society, 
provided you know what are the uh, considerations for group uh, one consideration is aggregate yes world is an aggregate 7 billion people are inhabiting earth today aggregate there is identity many people today identify with world citizenship and they feel that uh, national considerations are narrow we are all members of the same world there are international conventions conventions organizations to regulate behavior and there is flow mobility mobility of men and capital when there is a mobility of men and capital from one country to another then you can and that means interaction interaction between companies interaction between people interaction between organizations united nations summits international conferences international Co conference of sociologists international conference of chemists international conference of businessmen there are interactions between individuals and groups at the international level there are human rights proposed by united nations and almost all the countries of the world are morally obliged to accept the un charter for human rights a few uh, years ago a group of countries met at one place and developed millennium development goals that by this year in terms of certain socio economic indicators all the countries have to reach there we have to reduce poverty we have to reduce infant mortality etc etc and all the countries which are signatory to millennium development goals and even those countries which are not signatory feel uh, compelled to move in that direction if all these things are happening then you can say that today world society is emerging when there was no movement of people when there was no movement of people from one country to another when there was no interaction when there was no identity of world citizenship there was no world society but today you can say that starting from individual we can go up to words uh, world society has become the largest group so your life is not confined to your village or your caste or sub caste or kinship you are a member of world society increasingly we can uh, talk about world society 